fireworks at the end. <laughs> no, you have to bring your own fireworks. That's how oh, this works. I am happy to do that. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. To those of you who've logged in from different parts of the world, good morning as well. I'm really, really excited to be in conversation today with John Britt and Vaishaki, who are the wonderful co-authors of this book, What I Really Meant to Say, which is a very powerful book on communication. But what really struck me about this book is even though it has a lot of science and research behind it, even though the principles that they've spoken about are really solid and tested, it's a book that anybody can pick up and read. And I think that because it's been written in such a conversational style, such a pleasant style, uh, there's a lot of humor in the book as well when you see some of the role playing that happens in here. It's a book that I found a lot of value in. And so I'm really excited to be having this conversation with both the authors. I'm going to really quickly set some context about the authors by reading out their short bios. John Britt is an international best-selling author with a passion for helping organizations align their strategy with the day-to-day -day activities and behaviors to reach their goals. He assists companies in effective communication, improved accountability, superior customer service and change capacity. That's a lot of very cool things. John, welcome. Thank you so much for taking this time to be with us today. Thank uh, you for having me. Yeah, it's early in the morning, it's 7 a.m. I hope you've been adequately caffeinated. Perfect. Well done, John. <laughs> and we've got Vaishaki Bharucha, an advertising maven, cross-culture coach, and a content and brand specialist. She's won several national and international awards and is now a jury for many advertising awards. She conducts niche creative and writing workshops and facilitates using the Lego serious play methodology. Side note, uh, we need to speak about this Lego methodology because I'm a grown woman who's very excited in both Lego and cats. So we should have this conversation. Vaishaki, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really looking forward to your insights on what you both together to write this book. Um, when I was looking through it, Vaishaki, it said that you brought a lot of the cultural context into this book. So how did you feel that in a book on communication, cultural context was so important? And, and how, did you, how did you bring that in? So um, John pretty much had this idea about the book. And, uh, you know, uh, when I came in and I was adding my... Uh, thoughts to it right in the beginning when we kind of met and decided to collaborate. Um, I was telling John that, you know, let's, let's write a book that we both will read in the first place. And two is that I have a background in communications being in advertising for well over two decades. Uh, but what I realized when I joined the IT field was there was much more to communicating messages that persuade people to buy, you know, which is what I was doing in advertising. And that was the nuances of culture that we brought into our conversations. Um, and then uh, what I realized was that there was so much to it. So for the last 10 years, it's probably from 2011 onwards, you know, when I got into that, did a lot of research, did a lot of workshops, uh, interacted with you know, at least 40 different global communities, you know, did con understood country culture and realized that the magnanimity of that whole space was huge. So that's where I brought it into, uh, you know, and I said, John, maybe, you know, that's something we should cover. Uh, and that's what we did. Uh, John being John uh, was uh, very, very collaborative, extremely open to ideas. So, yeah, I think that's that's how it got uh, it got its place in the book. Lovely. I, I really like that line, John being John. But since uh, we haven't had the opportunity to get <laughs> John as well as you have, John, I'm going to request you 
to give us a little bit of an insight into what got you writing this book. And also if you have any sort of funny anecdotes or stories that really kind of demonstrate for you how important communication sure. is and how hilarious it can be when we get it wrong. We'd love sure, to hear. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I'll start with my wife has a PhD in English comp and rhetoric. So uh, if, if you get a copy of the book, you'll see I've dedicated it to her because she she's really the brains behind everything. But I, I happened to be with my wife several years ago uh, in, in, the, in the U.S. We have McDonald's. I don't know if you have McDonald's there. And it's a drive through restaurant. And um, I don't generally eat there, but they came out with this chicken wrap. And um, I, I enjoyed it. And all I had was a chicken wrap with lettuce, chicken, and tomato, three things. Uh, but my wife was with me, and we decided to get something. And I said, you watch. They won't get it right. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, I, I go through here all the time and it's always wrong. And she said, well, how are you ordering your chicken wrap? And so I told her I ordered my chicken wrap with just grilled chicken, just lettuce and just tomato. And she said, well, perhaps you're looking at this the wrong way. And I said, what do you mean? She said, you're ordering your chicken wrap from a constructionist perspective. So I look at her and I go. <laughs> you know what <laughs> she said you're building your chicken wrap and I said yeah and it's pretty simple grilled chicken lettuce tomato that's all I want on it she said but while you're busy telling them what you want on it the person at the screen is busy trying to, to figure out what to take off because there's seven things that come on a chicken wrap now how she knew that I don't know but she knew it there's seven things that comes on a chicken wrap so while you're busy trying to tell them what three that you want on they're busy trying to tell you what four they want to take off. And she said, so why don't you just order it the way they're looking at their screen? And it was an epiphany for me. And it, I, I think that is emblematic of, I can do what I can do in communication, the best that I can do, but as much as I can understand about that other person and where they're starting from, and if I can start there with them, I am more likely to get what I want and get it right the first time. And in fact, that's been my experience. Since then, I order it that way, and nine times out of ten, it's right. So, that that was kind of fun for me, and that 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 was uh, many many years ago, and it got me thinking about this idea of hey, there's you know, I say something, I want something. The other person that I'm trying to communicate with, you know, half the time I'm missing the mark. What can I do better to, you know, to try try to improve? And it's been a journey. I love it. So, Vaishaki, this idea of in communication, what can I do better? Uh, it leads me to this quote that you have in your book that says, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And that's by George Bernard Shaw. And I think that that really beautifully encapsulates what the point that you're trying to get across. So tell me, what often do you find are the biggest challenges in communication? And how did you how did you decide to focus this book around a certain set and, and design them as sort of A to Z? Um, so we realize that it's endless how communication can go wrong. In fact, uh, the more we explored it, uh, at some point I thought that we actually walk a minefield and it's a wonder we get out you know, on the other side uh, when we communicate because it's amazing what can go wrong. Uh, John and I, I identified, uh, you know, 10 major factors in, you know, uh, basically the pitfalls, which could be everything from attitude to bias to culture, as we spoke about. Um, and we realized that uh, what, what could go wrong was bigger than what could go right. Uh, and therefore, we said that what if we actually turn things around and showcase what could go right if we were just... Uh, exploring each tiny bit in an example. So that's why the A to Z happened. But at no point do we say that that, you know, covers everything. Uh, we, I feel we've just scratched the surface. Um, I feel communication can go real now. I mentor a lot of writers and they write something and then I tell them that to me, this sounds like this and this is Oh, but that's that's really not what I meant, and uh, you know that's how uh, you know the title of the book also says it. You know because, and we we played on the word 
meant and mean if you see how we've done it on the cover and John was very keen we do that because it's really like that I mean to say something I meant to say something but how it lands I have to be really careful and conscious of how I communicate so yeah yeah so Manoj has said communicating across the generations okay Okay, and just K seem to have completely different meanings. And uh, Manoj, I don't know if you've had a chance to read this book, but one of one of the key concepts about this is sort of communicating across generations and genders. So, uh, Baishaki, would you be able to take this question and kind of walk us through how this works? Um, I can't see the chat here. What's the question? Oh, he's he. It's it's more of a comment actually. But if you could touch upon yes. how communicating across genders and so um generation especially generation i find now you know with with uh, technology leading everything we do uh, i do find that there's a lot of ageism that is coming into the picture you know the discrimination because you are just older because it takes um, and i can safely say i'm i'm old and the previous generation uh, but it takes us longer to get the, the hang of technology um, and I find that some youngsters get really, really impatient with that. There's also the sense of arrogance amongst youngsters that because they know technology, they know everything. Uh, there is also bias from the older people that, you know, so it works both ways. You know, you have an older person saying, oh, these youngsters. Whereas I find that when I work <laughs> with the youth uh, and we exchange uh, you know, there is that, you know, proper uh, knowledge transfer. It is so amazing because we learn from each other. And I feel that if that communication can be conveyed to them, because I do a lot of coaching with youngsters and I keep telling them that, you know, I have a lot to learn from you. And they, their eyebrows are raised, you know, because I realize that they find that much bias as we find it from them. And that communication is what we have portrayed in uh, in the, in the story, uh, the scenario that we have for uh, you know the gender communication. That if that you know the young boy in the office actually helps her with a very minor printer problem, that's sure to offset somebody who is not tech savvy. You know, you have error, error, and some four oh four three seventy two error, and do this <laughs> that. Give me a break. Yeah, just tell me or restart or whatever. Um, but I feel that again, that communication, can I communicate to someone without bias that I don't know this, I need your help. Can I also expect the same kind of unbiased approach to me and what I'm saying? And, you know, can we work together? So I think that that's something that is really, really a key job of communication where I accept you, I respect you no matter your age. And the same thing with uh, gender, I mean. You know, gender communication is a huge thing by itself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Neeti says it's great that you already have a chapter in the book about it. John, could you talk to us a little bit about how you find gender and communication um, and also a little bit of the, about this cultural context that you wanted and that Vaishaki was kind enough to bring in? Yeah, I'd, I'd be glad to. Um, I, I might start with you know, we, we piggyback off of uh, the book Crucial Conversations and the definition of communication, that it, it's an exchange of meaning between two or more individuals, N not necessarily an exchange of words, not necessarily an exchange of something written, an, an exchange of meaning. And so when, when I think about the male, female, the, the generational um, differences, that's the place to start is, is what do I think has meaning? And then being very respectful as Vashaki uh, has talked about when we're trying to approach something because uh, as Vashaki said, you know, I'm 60 and I work with a group of folks that are younger and they just, they don't have the same, uh, they have strong values, but it's not the same value system that I have. It's not, and I don't have the same one they have and one's not right or wrong. We just need to better understand it. And then that air of respect as we communicate to not come across as if I'm right, you're wrong, is extremely important. Um, now, 
when we were writing the book, uh, I had a, a bit of the manuscript done just as a starting point. And when I got introduced to Vaishaki, it, it was like uh, manna from heaven for me because. Oh, thank you, John. What, what I realized, and I say, I say this in all due respect, I'm proud of who I am, but I'm a white male and, and I have a white male perspective. And Vaishaki in her very, very um, uh, honest and kind way came along and said, hey, maybe we ought to infuse some gender information and some cross culture and you know this is a you're writing from an american white male perspective and you know it, it was like oh you know because that's who i am and so when she came along that just the value of the meaning of the book I think went up exponentially because you know the generational chapter wasn't in there the gender chapter wasn't in there you know we, i had something else in that place that i had in mind and so um it, it was very, very helpful. And I might just add that we wrote it during the pandemic. And so the, there's an overlay of the pandemic and the influence of the pandemic in the book that influences communication that I think the reader, you know, when they get a chance to see it, we'll see that thread as well. Yeah. Sorry, are you going to add something, Vashaki? Yeah, I wanted to add this, you know, especially the pandemic part because uh, you know, everything shifted to technology at that time. And uh, um, there were times when, uh, you know, I, I was doing a lot of leadership workshops with a facilitation group at that time. And there were, and we used to exhort everyone to put on their videos, put on their videos. And there were times when there was chaos going on in people's lives, you know, and and people were touched or moved by something. They could not switch on their videos. And we, we realized that there's so much more to communication than just uh, getting people to talk or getting people to be out there. It was very, very difficult. And that's why we did this whole thing about pandemic overlay because, you know, are you also seeing what people are not seeing? Um, are they just switching off their videos because... Uh, they want to or they want to walk away and do something else or are they switching off the video because they don't want you to see them in a vulnerable space uh, so so that was actually that whole sensitivity that we brought to the pandemic overlay although it was the same thing but suddenly in the during the pandemic you know there were frayed nerves were, you know there were people were in a very raw space um, so that was one aspect that we added to the whole space and we thought that you know, with the pandemic, pandemics changed us, all of us. Mm -hmm. Either, you know, we've shifted, if not by, by a foot, by an inch at least, all of us. I don't think anyone stayed untouched. Um, and I think that that has impacted communication and communication has impacted us during the pandemic. So, yeah. Right. I mean, it's, it's very interesting to see how you go through the whole book and then you have the separate kind of section on how you deal with the pandemic. How do you feel things are shifting back now? Or do you think that they're forever transformed? Or what do you see as a future of communication? I, I think things have, things have moved. I think things will never go back to where they were uh, earlier. I think we've, we've learned our lessons with the pandemic, but we also learned what good the pandemic brought us in terms of technology. For instance, would we have would we be able to have this conversation today? Uh, and I'm not saying Zoom was not there before the pandemic. I had a Zoom account and I used to proudly just have Zoom meetings for the heck of using the account. Right. <laughs> Versus seeing the value now that, okay, I can communicate with anybody every, anywhere. And uh, th that's how John and I have worked across uh, Zoom for the entire book. We've not met. Uh, so I think we've seen the advantages of it, but we've also seen disadvantages of, you know, commuting for two or three hours to the office and stuff like that. We want to be home and we want to go out and sometimes just hug someone, sometimes just sit across the table and have coffee with someone. And like you're saying, seeing how tall or short they are, right? <laughs> I think it's both ways. Yeah. 
So John, we have a we have a question and comment from Deepthi Singh, and she says this happens so much in professional communications too. It's not the incorrect vocabulary; it's just the choice of words doesn't match the thoughts in the head. This causes conflicts and creates a negative image. Is there a glossary of words to be used in a professional setup? How do we draw that emotional disconnect line with coworkers or people who we spend the majority of our day with? Oh wow, there's another book there. I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think I would start with both in the um, professional and and even in our um, private lives is to keep it as simple as possible. The words. Uh, my, my wife has coached me a lot on this because in my professional world, I work for a CPA firm that does consulting in hospitals. And so I'm in a highly professional environment, and my tendency is, is to embellish, and um, I, I sort of want people to know I, that I know what I'm talking about. And that can be, you know, when you start that, I know what's in my head, but it can be overwhelming for them. And, and so I think she's done a good job of bringing me back to, you know, when you're trying to explain something simple is better, that let's not get caught up in the vernacular let's not get caught up in the acronyms let's not get caught up in all the uh, bureaucracy and one-upmanship just keep it simple and once you've once you've articulated what you the meaning that you hope you're transmitting then it, then there's another step then um, as my son used to say when he was really small because I taught him this, put your big ears on <laughs> like Mickey Mouse. And it's time to listen. It's time to listen after you've articulated and try to determine, here's what I said and here's what I meant. Did they get it? And it's, it's, those are sometimes follow-up questions, but uh, th there was a whole lot packed in that question and I'm bringing it down to what I can feel like I can handle on this call. And that is j just try to keep things simple and uh, straightforward and respectful. Uh, let me just add that respectful. Uh, kindness goes a long way as you're communicating. Yeah. Um, I'd like to add over here that, you know, these are uh, the vocabulary, uh, you know, at the workplace and at home, I feel overall could be pretty similar. Uh, I think we, we have to stop creating strong walls between who we are at home and who we are uh, outside. Uh, and that's why uh, some of the scenarios we've created are scenarios where, you know, there's a young couple and a child working from home. And, um, you know, what the mother is telling the child not to do, the boss is telling the mother not to do. So really now boundaries are blurred and I don't think that's going to change. Um, also, we have a chapter called... Um, uh, hold however if I'm not mistaken where the whole idea is that if somebody's saying something instead of no but can you say yes and because no but is what's what kills conversations versus yes and actually builds on conversations and ideas um, and it was strange because this came to me when through some again serendipity uh, on improv you know on improv and in, in drama, but this is something that I've learned in advertising. If somebody's coming out with an idea, don't judge that idea before you explore it. So can we build on people's ideas versus you know immediately um, you know, judge it and say, this will never work. Uh, and, and it all kind of fell in place uh, you know, with that. So I feel that there is no strong line between uh, workplace and uh, the home. And, I don't see why we we don't say, for instance, give feedback to the people at home. Uh, you know, we just take them for granted. Uh, you need to do that too with friends too, uh, you know, people close to you. Um, we do it very strict, you know, strictly in office, appraisal time, and we don't do it at home at all. So 
You know, I, I think I would like to give appraisals to my husband at some point, but that's probably not a, a discussion to have on a broadcast in Zoom. <laughs> but um, coming back to this, what I really like is, you know, you've embodied the spirit in your book again, where you're talking about how sometimes communication is not so dissimilar when it's happening at home and when it's happening in the office. And holding however can you give us that an example uh and i love how you've done that in the book of how the same same philosophy or the same principle applies in the home context and outside because i think a lot of us kind of say yes but without thinking about it too much and and how do you think that 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 works so so the one that we have is the um no but yes and and i was giving the improv example uh, that in theater, when people do improv, um, it's building something from scratch and it's usually extempo. Uh, but the minute you break it down and when, when a character is creating a scene, so of course you have taken a bank robbery scene and a character you know, pokes a finger into someone's ribs and says, um, okay, this is a hold up and you know, take me to the lockers. And that person says, oh, but you are, this is just a finger, this is not a gun. And the whole thing breaks down. Versus another character saying, oh, you know, don't shoot, don't, uh, you know, I'll, I'll do what you say, and builds on the scenario till it goes to its logical end. Um, and that's exactly what this guy who's doing theater realizes he had been doing to his wife. And that's why they reached a point where there was no conversation because he had killed all the conversations. Every time she said something, said no, but, you know, not this, not that, um, instead of saying yes, and. And the minute he turned around and said yes, and, you know, they started rebuilding that uh, relationship. So it was him, not necessarily at work, but, you know, in the improv, uh, uh, he was doing a course in theater. And then he comes home and he does this. Uh, and, and kind of rekindles that communication with his wife. And the other example we've given is on, uh, if I'm not mistaken, on feedback, where uh, this lady has quit jobs because she was not getting feedback from her earlier boss, uh, appreciates the fact that one year down the line, just on time, the boss has given her proper feedback. She's really, really very happy with the appraisal. She's driving home and she says, oh my God, I, I don't tell my children what I like and I don't like. How about I tell them three things that I like and three things that, you know, they should change. And she decides on the way back home that she should start something like that instead of, you know, constantly telling them, you know, this is wrong and you shouldn't do this. You know, how about creating the film? And, and I think that that's a very doable thing. Uh, you know, with, with children, with your spouses. So yeah, Bindu, I think it's time to start an appraisal form for your husband. <laughs> I, I, I don't know whether we should get Lego involved in this or not, but I will reach out to you separately for that. This Manoj has brought up another important point, which is, you know, he says, let's not get up let's not get caught up in emoticons. I see them very often in emails and I'm often left wondering, which kind of brings me to the question of, okay, we're reading this book and we're understanding how we can do a better job at communicating. But at some level, we start seeing how others are not communicating effectively. And what do we do then? I'll start with that one. I think the, you know, the first thing is, is see, where they're, see where they're at. Again, that could be gender, it could, it could be uh, generational. Uh, I, I think, I might be wrong, the younger uh, generation are more likely to use the emoticons. And so as we, you know, if, if it's something that's influencing us, it's, if it's something that's uh, causing us to wonder, you know, what's the right message, uh, I would just sit down with that person in, in a one-on-one, uh, -on -one, quietly without any um, audience and just say, look, I'm getting this stuff, it's coming and it's, you know, there might be a generational gap, there might be something else, but I, I'm trying to understand when you do this, it, it, it doesn't resonate with me and I want it to. So help me understand what it is you're communicating when you do these things. 
think the first response should be to try to get them to stop doing it. I think the first response should be, what is it you're communicating? Because it might be important to them. And if you understand it, it might, uh, if you understand what it is and why they're doing it, that might put the, um, you know, the, uh, the misunderstandings aside. So that, that was, that is where I would start. Vashaki? Yeah, I feel that um, that a lot of it comes from, you know, what we in, uh, explain in the communication cycle. Am I listening to what that person is saying instead of just judging? Uh, you know, too many emoticons. Yeah. It's probably the language of the day. So, you know, as a linguist, I would say that, you know, you just have to go with what it is. But there's so many times when I get emoticons from youngsters and I, I turn around and ask them, what is that supposed to mean? Because I may be presuming something um, and that's not fair. They know I have mistaken the emoticons uh, multiple times, you know, and I've been told, no, that's not what it's supposed to mean. So it's a good idea to turn around and say that I don't understand this. Is there a reason why you put this emoticon? Um, and most people are willing to then explain uh, what they're saying. So I think it comes from, from listening a lot. Um, again, we have, uh, you know, query, query the quiet, you know. Sometimes it's nice to see why people are not saying anything. Uh, I hide behind emoticons. So I'll just send one thumbs up if I don't want to say anything. And it, it ends the conversation. So it, it's also how I use or abuse or misuse them. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm sure that there is a reason why someone is using it. So I agree with John. It's probably generation, it's gender, but it's a good idea to ask. You know, that I'm not getting this. What is it? Yeah, yeah. this is so important. I, I have to tell you a funny anecdote related to that, that that I had recently. I have the opportunity to work with a lot of teenagers who are songwriters and, you know, really, really talented. And so I got a WhatsApp message with a skull and um, I was not quite sure what that meant. So when I met her the next time, I'm like, so what was that skull about? She's like, Oh, that was that was LOL. I'm like, um, you don't use you don't use the yellow smiley with the you know the laughing face. Yeah, She's like, yeah. no, no, of course not. And then I actually Googled. So this means it was so funny, I died laughing. <laughs> and and I felt like such a fossil at that point. <laughs> I am thinking I'm cool. And yeah. uh, and yet apparently we don't we don't use those those emojis anymore. But yes, yeah, so it's very relevant. You were mentioning the communication cycle. I don't know if it's very clear if I show it like this, yes. but I would yes. love for you to kind of take a second and, and walk us through what, what it is. And how yeah. Uh, John, would you like to do this? Sure. sure. So, you know, just, just as a basic model in, in the first part of the book, you know, if everybody has the same understanding that with every uh, communication event, that there's a sender, there's a message, there's a receiver, and there's a feedback loop. And it does go in that loop. And what, what we've tried to communicate is all those barriers that get in the way that prevent that cycle from having clarity. Because that's what we're looking for in communication is clarity of meaning. What the sender sends is what the sender hopes the receiver receives <laughs> and vice versa till they come to clarity. Because uh, this may sound harsh and, and I, it doesn't, I don't mean it harsh, but in communication, oftentimes we're trying to get what we want and we're trying to influence other people. And I don't mean that from a, um, a negative perspective. I just mean that that's the nature that we we're, we're trying to interact. And so as clear as we can be and as clear as the receiver can be, the more likely we are to all evolve to get to the outcome that we're trying to get to, whether that's a, a deeper love in our marriage or whether that's, uh, hey, I want that promotion at work. And, and, then we, and then we just have the day-to-day -day things where we're not necessarily trying to get something, but we do want to be clear and have that clarity uh, from the other person. So um, those things like gender and bias and other things that Vashaki mentioned, you know, they're, they're barriers that we have to recognize within ourselves 
and others when we can. But the most influence that we can have is on ourselves. And so I was talking to someone yesterday when we start influencing ourselves and changing, hopefully improving our communication, there's a rebound effect on those we're communicating with. It just happens. Now we're going to run into some people, I think, that is, that are just very hard to communicate with. And no matter what we do, there's just a barrier there, but we do what we can do. We look in the mirror and go, yeah, I did my best. Yeah. So, but that, that, that is the cycle. Bindu, if, if I could, somebody put um, a um, chat up about the quiet and, and Vashaki mentioned it, but I, I would like to just add to that, that so many meetings, so, so many times, you know, people just don't say anything. You go through the meeting, uh, Vashaki said they turn off their cameras, or, you know, and, and we've actually got a chapter in the book called Query the Quiet, where we, we believe it's very important that you don't accept uh, silence as consent. That when someone is silent and we're trying to move down the road with, at work or at home with something, just because they're being silent, that doesn't mean they agree. And so, uh, and there's other things built into that chapter, but it's very important that we understand silence. Some, sometimes it is consent, many times it's not. Sometimes that person's thinking, but it deserves attention. When, when it's quiet and, and, and you, when you have that funny feeling where, well, that person's not saying anything, I wonder, it, it deserves attention. That doesn't mean anything's wrong, but you, you can in your own way poke and, and try to get, hey, you know, what do you think? Um, you know, we all have different personalities. There's introverts and extroverts, but again, being respectful of that, let's give people the chance to have a voice, but sometimes they wanna have it privately. Sorry, I went off on a tangent there. No, no perfect. Thank, thank you for addressing Rajita's question. Sorry, Vaishaki, please go ahead. Uh, no, I, I just, I was uh, going back to the communication cycle. What also happens is, you know, a lot of times we respond even before we let the other person finish saying what he or she is saying. And because mm -hmm. we've not even heard them completely, uh, our response is already wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not wrong, but it doesn't come from an informed space. And, and that's where the, you know, this, the simplicity of the communication cycle is actually the, uh, you know, is actually the profoundness of that cycle. Because all I have to do is I have to wait for you to finish what you are saying and then respond. Because then even the other person knows whether I have understood or not understood that person. So then they can turn around and says, no, say that, no, you've got me wrong. But if I've heard them halfway, I'm not really responding from a space of an informed person. So that's that's actually the essential communication cycle because uh, John speaks, I respond. My response is what John is listening to. He waits for me to complete and then he responds and it could be something as simple as, no, Vaishaki, I think you've, you've got this completely wrong. This is what I was trying to say. And then it continues, you know, but what happens is that it then becomes a complete cycle. We break the cycle before it even happens. So. Right. If, um, if anyone in the audience has any questions, please do put them in the chat. Uh, we've already got some very interesting ones that we've discussed. I see another comment from Manoj. Before we get to that, I'd like to ask you, John, when writing the A to Z, do you have a favorite? Do you have, uh, you know, one key skill that you think that someone should really focus on? I do. And, you know, there are so many. And even the A to Z, as, as Bashaki said, doesn't represent everything. It's a starting point. But when, when we got to uh, the K and landed on Kindle Kindness, that, that actually resonated extremely strongly with Bashaki and I. And, and one could think, okay, Kindle Kindness, that's not really a communication technique per se. Uh, maybe not technically, but it's, it, there's so many things that overlay communication and how we say something to someone, uh, the timing, the tone, uh, the, 
the sense of respect or empathy. It just goes so much further if we can kindle kindness. That And, and I, I venture to say everyone on this call, today there might be some interaction where, uh, as we say here, I don't know if this means anything there, get your hackles up, you know, so, you know, internally you're going, hey, okay, I'm starting to get angry. But stop, mitigate, figure out how to respond in a kind way. It doesn't have to be that you're not being direct or not addressing what needs to be addressed. But I think we move the conversation along toward clarity, ultimately, so much more consistently when we're kind to one another. And um, probably the last thing I'd say to that is the, the hardest part, the hardest uh, scenarios to do that are the people you're closest to. Right. Totally. It's so easy to go off, if you will, or to get angry and, and lash out on someone you're close to because you, you almost know they're going to forgive you, right? And we're in this for the long term. Um, I'm working on it and have been for a long time. And, and I think, and, and it's changed my marriage. It's changed the way my wife and I interact in a really strong way. So th th there's some real positive things for you when you start taking some of these things to heart. So John, does that help you with your annual marriage appraisals? Like, do you get, do you get marked higher because you kindle yeah. kindness? That, that's, that's good. I should, I should learn this. Yeah. I was reading an article this morning about um, how as parents, when we tend to snap at our children, when we see them doing something, especially the, the younger ones, we tend to say no. And this article suggests that instead of saying no, as the first response, take a second and say, Oh, so when you're saying, oh, you're giving your sense, uh, you're giving yourself a second to react, and then it can be followed by yes or no or great or whatever, but maybe yeah. maybe that's that's something. Yeah. Uh, Shaki, I'm going to come back to Manoj's point where he says, wouldn't trying to understand someone's silence take away or distract you from the clarity of your message, trying to analyze silence? I don't think so because uh, there, there are two aspects to this. One is I have communicated a message, but then I also have to wait for the response. If the response is silence, I have to try and figure that out. And like John says, you know, I shouldn't look at it as um, one consent and two that, uh, you know, that the person's completely all right because if it's if it merits a response and I get silence, then I should be seriously worried. So yeah. Um, Dr. Hishmi says, how can you make communication effective when we're not seeing each other in a virtual environment? And I know we've touched upon this a yeah. bit, but any more quick tips or points or um I find that a uh, couple of things make a big difference. One is, uh, you know, simple physical aspects of communication, like speaking slowly, trying to see whether you are understood, putting stuff in chat like we are doing now uh, makes a big difference. Uh, I prefer keeping my video on for all interactions that I have, no matter whether it's with my, uh, you know, with the, with the people, the youngsters I mentor, or it's with a client, or even if it's with friends, because somehow just looking at people and their responses make a big difference. I also feel that that means that I have to pay a lot more attention when you're on the screen, uh, you know. Uh, when you're not seeing each other and if you're on a call, uh, I find, and this is something I always do, I always have a book and a pen when I have a call. I write things down, I, I repeat, I ask them. Uh, you know, what they're saying. And I can safely tell you that I don't think I get it 100% of the time. It is a difficult business. It is difficult. But I think that the intent to want to get the message right, to get the communication right, is, is what you start with and then try and get it right as much as possible. I, I might add that if it's a business call, a business Zoom, a business Teams meeting, then one of my practices that I find helpful is after the call, I send out 
uh, an email to all the participants. This is what I heard. This is what we committed to. This is who committed to it. This is the time frame. You have, you know, two days. I, you know, I always put, I might have heard it wrong. So, you know, clarify for me if I miss it. But if in two business days I don't hear from you, I'm going to assume consent that this is what it is. Right. Right. And, and it's, and it just, and most of the time, I miss I miss something and somebody goes, no, I, I said this, not that. That's fine. That's what we're, we're clarifying, but it's an add-on to the Zoom yeah. meeting. Yeah. Um, and yeah, John, it's really important to say that I'm going to assume consent basis, you know, the time you've given them because then right. you're not presuming anything. Right. Um, I think we have another question, how to balance hyper-communicative type of people where <laughs> I cannot stop. Um. I have seen this, especially in my workshops, you know, there are, uh, say, one or two people who constantly want to talk versus someone who doesn't speak at all. Um, it's easier when you're facilitating to be able to say that, uh, okay, let's let's hear so-and-so or let's, you know, you, you call out a couple of people. Uh, but if you're in a social situation, it does become difficult. I think it's just a question of maneuvering um, through the tiny spaces, uh, you know, that they let you go. I, I know exactly the kind of person you're talking about, uh, but, but it's nice to stop and say, hey, let's, let's hear what so-and-so has to say. And it can be polite, but firm, but it is very possible for them to also understand that there are others, you know, who would like to have a voice out there, so... Sumitra asks, is there a right time and a right way to communicate our boundaries to our partners without hurting their feelings? I think there is, there are, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of, I don't know the right time, but there is definitely a right way. And uh, I think that, you know, John touched upon it when he said Kindle kindness. I found that a lot just comes with empathy and understanding. Um, and I just want to bring that up over here is that, you know, when I had this uh, a book reading and launch in Bangalore recently, uh, one of the first questions that came up uh, to me was uh, from someone who had read the book and then come there. And she said, you know, I know there's this chapter on Kindle kindness and she brought it up. I had not. Um, and she said, you know, if someone's being nasty to me all the time, I cannot be kind. <laughs> and uh, and the whole chapter, like John says, it's not about communication. It's sometimes walking away from escalating uh, conversations. Um, but the point here is that if I, I have empathy for the other person who is just being nasty for the sake of it, it's easy to walk away. And by the same logic, you know, when, when you are communicating with your partner, um, right way would be to start with empathy and not um, not attack, accuse, or play the blame game. Uh, we have uh, touched upon that in the book also. We have some scenarios uh, because again, communication between uh, partners is, is key to most relationships, including family relationships. So. So John, coming back to um, the fact that a lot of people in this audience, it's the All India Management Association's Young Leaders Council, a lot of us are in business and jobs. So in professional environments, how do you think this book could be helpful? How do you think, uh, like if I've read this book and I'm very inspired and I think it's something that could really, you know, change things for the team that I manage or the team that I'm a part of, how would you say that I would, I could take it forward? Well, I'll start by buying a book for everyone. <laughs> uh, take it back to take it back to your teams. Uh, the, the book is designed uh, deliberately in a way that the reader doesn't have to read it front to back cover. That, that's not the intent is for you to read the introduction and look at the table of contents, the A to Z, and then personally look at, hey, where do I need to focus on? For me, if I picked up the book today, I would immediately go to. Uh, listen loyally. I don't always listen all the, way, all the way till the end. And I would try to learn what could I do differently tomorrow to get better at that. So there's a personal aspect to it, but it also resonates at work because there's so much communication that happens with teams. 
you could get together as a team and take that table of contents and say, what, what's the top four or five things that we need to work on as a team in communicating with one another? And then start talking through that. Look at the do's and don'ts and how, how should we communicate? But I think it's an ideal book for a leader or a manager to take back to their team. I think the principles will help all their team members personally, but I think there's also just an overarching opportunity for improved communication at work. Yeah, yeah. I see a question that is how much is, or how effective is body language in communication? Yeah. I'll start and I'll let by shock. I, I remember reading about a few, gosh, a few years ago, uh, up to 60% or more of your communication happens with, through body language. And, and that, that's huge. I think it's related to the intimacy of the two correspondents uh, as well, you know, that understand each other, uh, each other's body language, but it's extremely important. I go back to that uh, definition of um, communication is the exchange of meaning between two or more individuals. And when I workshop this, sometimes I'll look at the audience and say, how many of you in the audience have had an exchange of meaning with someone close to you in the last couple of days that didn't involve words. And I give it a moment and I'll just, then I say, I do. My wife looked at me like <laughs> this. <laughs> the words were needed, right? Yeah. And so we just have to be very open and understanding. You know, if we're in a meeting and somebody rolls their eyes, you know, they don't need Bazine. They, they need <laughs> information, direction, guidance, et cetera. And so it's extremely important. And that's why I think the, the Zoom calls uh, take a little bit away from yeah. the transference of meaning. Vashaki, add on to that. Um, no, I think, John, you pretty much covered it. Uh, I really, I really, you know, I joke with some of the people that I get down to calls with saying that you know, on a Zoom call, I don't even know whether the person has hands or legs, you know, it's just, it's yeah. just, a, you know, it's it's a passport photo, unfortunately. Yeah. So you have to just right. uh, kind of, and, and of course, if the uh, video is off, it's all gone. So body language yeah. is very important, but over and above, I think how you choose your words, your tone of voice, uh, you know, how you come across or how you even your intent in communicating is really important, especially when you don't have, uh, you know, the body language. So, yeah. I see a very interesting question from Neil, and I'd like to know the answer to this as well. Which was the most difficult concept to portray in a scenario? And again, I'd like to, to underline that what I really liked about this book was that you put scenarios in for, for every item from A to Z, just so people were would be able to relate to how this happens in practice. So how was it for you creating these scenarios? And were there any that were particularly difficult to come up with a scenario for? I'll go with that. So yes, uh, we decided that this book would not be preachy. And, uh, you know, I told John, let's not write a book that I will not read because <laughs> I don't even listen to the navigating voice in the car, you know, telling me turn right, turn left. I find it very patronizing. And I don't want that. So we said, how can we make it uh, you know, really, and John had these scenarios in mind. So it's not like it was uh, not there but and as we got momentum it became even easier more relatable and we said what else can we do uh, for me the slightly difficult one was the one with uh, z or z as john would put it the zoom to zero because we were kind of uh, not sure what to do with uh, the letter z and um, you know, I kept wondering what to do. And it came to me when I was watching uh, uh, a Jennifer Lopez movie, if you please. Uh, and I said, I kind of got the idea, but then to create, you know, retrofit a scenario to it was was difficult. Um, I don't know. I leave it to the readers to tell me whether it makes sense or not. I, I think it does. 
uh, but yeah, it was difficult to do that. So I didn't start with the scenario. I started with a thought. And then I told John, I said, I think, you know, we can do this. Um, and you'll have to wait till I write it and send it to you. And then, uh, you know, then John added to it. And I mean, um, so yeah, this is the time when I gush about John that John's been absolutely fantastic to work with. Uh, very patient, very kind, would value everything I say, uh, always turned around and said, oh yeah, this is, you know, this is great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> his responses were immediate. I wrote in spots. He's structured, I'm unstructured, but um, it's been, it's been really fantastic, uh, you know, to work Thank with. you. As as we wrap this up, I'm going to take the opportunity to kind of go go behind the book, as it were, and say that, I mean, it's it's great reading the book and understanding all of these points. But did you have any challenges when communicating with each other across, you know, across <laughs> continents? And you've got the cultural difference. You've got the gender difference. I'm not going to put too fine a point on it, but there looks like a generational difference as well, slightly. So how did you how did you um, how did you overcome that or did you did you have to deal with it at all? How did you address it? John, can I tell the story of our... Sure, sure. Yeah. So when I first Please. started talking to John and you know, we just had a couple of calls before we started working together and I said, John, you do know that um, we both speak a different language. And John said, no, we speak English. And I said, no, we speak English differently and the words mean something else. Um, the first um, narrative that we worked on was um, avoiding assumptions. And... The, it's an office scenario where this uh, guy's been called uh, to uh, his boss's office, uh, a lady, and uh, he just gets a cryptic message saying, my office, uh, 5.30. And he goes into a tizzy about what it could be and stuff like that. Um, but when I wrote the scenario, again, you know, I envisaged an Indian office corporate office, bosses in that cabin in the corner. And uh, I wrote there, my cabin, 5.30. And so we shared it. Uh, John came back with some edits. And then we have a call. And as usual, John's polite and stuff like that. And then we talk about what's working. And then he says, oh, Shaki, I have a question. And I said, yeah. And he said, cabin. And then I realized that cabin in the U.S. means something else. It's one locked cabin in the world. <laughs> Why did the boss call this right. guy? <laughs> Why is my boss calling me to his cabin in the woods at yeah. 5.30? You know, and the best part is she's a lady and this is the guy uh, re reporting to her. So, oh my God, the nuances were insane. <laughs> and he had such a good laugh. And I said, okay, so John, it begins now. Because that was the letter A we were talking about. And I said, this right. is where we, uh, <laughs> you know, we speak a different language. So right. yes, there were, there were uh, some. This, I don't think there were challenges. It was fun, uh, yeah. you know, looking at it from that point of view. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was, it's like we were brother and sisters in another life once we met. We just had the same sort of goals and um, aspirations and and styles really perfect yeah yeah i want to thank you both so much for being with us here today and ask you each to give us one closing message or closing thought about the book that we'd like to take is it if there's one thing that we could start doing today or if there's one message that you really want us to remember what would that be and john i'm going to request you to go first sure um I mentioned this before, and I think many, many folks struggle with this. Um, uh, I'll go to the L is listen loyally, which means listening not only all the way to the end, but listening with your ears, with your mind, with your eyes, with the body language, and let the person who is attempting to communicate something to you finish. And once they've done that, then have the respect to, in the right situations, to give them feedback, that feedback loop to say, I heard you say, and it can't be mechanical, it has to come natural, but I heard you say this, 
And this is what that means to me. On those important communications that you have with people, make sure that what you think they said is what they meant and what they meant to you. So listen loyally all the way to the end, um, eyes, ears, heart, mind, and then uh, some feedback to make sure that, that you heard them the right way. Um, Thank you. Uh, thanks, Doc. Um, I really believe that what we've, uh, what we've, uh, what you've asked is what I would say is just look at one, one thing, anything that calls out to you, and internalize it. Um, I can safely say that you know while we've written the book and I've been an integral part of the book, I don't think that my communication skills are anywhere there. I think I'm at A. Uh, I assume a lot of things and I have to be very, very clear that I don't jump to conclusions when people are saying that, that I don't, um, you know, take it as I have understood what they've said. So, to, you know, to add to what John is saying about listen loyally, I now have started questioning myself that am I assuming that I've understood can I get more clarity? Can I ask more questions instead of just, you know, presuming and assuming stuff and then, you know, carrying on from there? So for me, that is the biggest lesson and that starts with A. So I have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. And I would want uh, readers to do the same thing. I don't think it's a book to be read cover to cover. I think it's just you read the beginning and then you pick up uh, to, you know, pick up the page that calls to you. It's as simple as that. Wonderful. There are so many people thanking you in, in the chat. I hope you Thank have a you. chance. Yeah. Thanks everyone. I think it's been really, really um, lovely, great questions. Uh, I think Kirit is asking, the book is already available on Amazon.in. The, the link has been posted. It's here. Please have a look. Uh, get a copy of the book if you're able to. I truly, truly enjoyed speaking to you both today, Vaishaki and John. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the IMA YLC, I'd like to thank everyone in the audience for showing up. Special thanks to Rhythm and the YLC and the IMA teams for making this a smooth experience. And I really look forward to having more chats with you, John and Vaishaki sometime in the future. And please join us for our next YLC event. If you're on our mailing list, you will find out about that soon. Have a good morning, evening, afternoon, everybody. And thank you for logging in. Thank thanks, you, Bindu. Thanks for your time. And thanks to AIMA for organizing this. It's been a lovely yes. experience. And thanks to all the audience members for your time. Yes. Have a good